preface the last sketch of Emma, a fragment of a story. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Oxenhandler. Emma, a fragment of a story by Charlotte Bronte. This fragment, the last literary effort of the author of Jane Eyre, appeared in the Cornhill magazine for April 1860, preceded by the following introduction from the pen of its editor, Mr. W. M. Thackeray, entitled The Last Sketch. Not many days since I went to visit a house where in former years I had received many a friendly welcome. We went into the owner's and artist's studio, prints, pictures, and sketches hung on the walls, as I had last seen and remembered them. The implements of the painter's art were there, the light, which had shone upon so many, many hours of patient and cheerful toil, poured through the northern window upon print and bust, lay figure and sketch, and upon the easel before which the good, the gentle, the beloved Leslie laboured. In this room the busy brain had devised and the skilful hand executed, I know not how many of the noble works which have delighted the world with their beauty and charming humour. Here the poet, called up into pictorial presence and informed with life, grace, beauty, infinite friendly mirth, and wondrous naturalness of expression, the people of whom his dear books told him the stories, his Shakespeare, his Cervantes, his Moliere, his Le Sage. There was his last work on the easel, a beautiful, fresh, smiling face of Titania such as his sweet, guileless fancy imagined the Midsummer Night's Queen to be. Gracious and pure and bright, the sweet, smiling image glimmers on the canvas. Fairy elves, no doubt, were to have been grouped around their mistress in laughing clusters. Honest Bottom's grotesque head and form are indicated as reposing by the side of the consummate beauty. The darkling forest would have grown around them, with the stars glittering from the midsummer sky. The flowers at the queen's feet and the boughs and foliage about her would have been peopled with gambling sprites and fays. They were dwelling in the artist's mind, no doubt, and would have been developed by that patient, faithful, admirable genius. But the busy brain stopped working. The skillful hand fell lifeless. The loving, honest heart ceased to beat. What was she to have been? that fair Titania, when perfected by the patient skill of the poet who in imagination saw the sweet innocent figure, and the tender courtesy and caresses, as it were, posed and shaped and traced the fair form. Is there record anywhere of fancies conceived, beautiful, unborn? Some day they will assume form in some yet undeveloped light. If our bad unspoken thoughts are registered against us and are written in the awful account, Will not the good thoughts unspoken, the love and tenderness, the pity, beauty, charity, which pass through the breast and cause the heart to throb with silent good, find a remembrance too? A few weeks more, and this lovely offspring of the poet's conception would have been complete, to charm the world with its beautiful mirth. May there not be some sphere unknown to us where it may have an existence? They say our words, once out of our lips, go travelling in omne ovum, reverberating for ever and ever. If our words, why not our thoughts? If the has been, why not the might have been? Some day our spirits may be permitted to walk in galleries of fancies more wondrous and beautiful than any achieved works which at present we see, and our minds to behold and delight in masterpieces which poets and artists' minds have fathered and conceived only. With a feeling much akin to that with which I looked upon the friends, the admirable artist's unfinished work, I can fancy many readers turning to these last pages which were traced by Charlotte Bronte's hand. Of the multitude that has read her books, who has not known and deplored the tragedy of her family, her own most sad and untimely fate? Which of her readers has not become her friend? Who that has known her books has not admired the artist's noble English, the burning love of truth, the bravery, the simplicity, the indignation at wrong, the eager sympathy, the pious love and reverence, the passionate honor, so to speak, of the woman? 
What a story is that of that family of poets in their solitude yonder on the gloomy northern moors. At nine o'clock at night, Mrs. Gaskell tells, after evening prayers, when their guardian and relative had gone to bed, the three poetesses, the three maidens, Charlotte and Emily and Anne, Charlotte being the motherly friend and guardian to the other two, began like restless wild animals to pace up and down their parlour, making out their wonderful stories, talking over plans and projects, and thoughts of what was to be their future life. One evening at the close of 1854, as Charlotte Nichols sat with her husband by the fire, listening to the howling of the wind about the house, she suddenly said to her husband, If you had not been with me, I must have been writing now. She then ran upstairs and brought down and read aloud the beginning of a new tale. When she had finished, her husband remarked, The critics will accuse you of repetition. She replied, Oh, I shall alter that. I always begin two or three times before I can please myself. But it was not to be. The trembling little hand was to write no more. The heart, newly awakened to love and happiness, and throbbing with maternal hope, was soon to cease to beat. That intrepid outspeaker and champion of truth, that eager, impetuous redresser of wrong, was to be called out of the world's fight and struggle, to lay down the shining arms and to be removed to a sphere where even a noble indignation, cor alterius nequit lacerare, and where truth complete and right triumphant no longer need to wage war. I can only say of this lady, vidi tantum, I saw her first just as I rose out of an illness from which I had never thought to recover. I remember the trembling little frame, the little hand, the great honest eyes. An impetuous honesty seemed to me to characterize the woman. Twice, I recollect, she took me to task for what she held to be errors of doctrine. Once, about fielding, we had a disputation. She spoke her mind out. She jumped too rapidly to conclusions. I have smiled at one or two passages in the biography in which my own disposition or behavior forms the subject of talk. She formed conclusions that might be wrong, and built up whole theories of character upon them. New to the London world, she entered it with an independent, indomitable spirit of her own, and judged of contemporaries, and especially spied out arrogance or affectation, with extraordinary keenness of vision. She was angry with her favorites if their conduct or conversation fell below her ideal. Often she seemed to me to be judging the London folk prematurely. But perhaps the city is rather angry at being judged. I fancied an austere little Joan of Arc marching in upon us and rebuking our easy lives, our easy morals. She gave me the impression of being a very pure and lofty and high-minded person. A great and holy reverence of right and truth seemed to be with her always. Such in our brief interview she appeared to me. As one thinks of that life, so noble, so lonely, of that passion for truth, of those nights and nights of eager study, swarming fancies, invention, depression, elation, prayer, as one reads the necessarily incomplete, though most touching and admirable history of the heart that throbbed in this one little frame, of this one amongst the myriads of souls that have lived and died on this great earth, this great earth, this little speck in the infinite universe of God, with what wonder do we think of today, with what awe await tomorrow, when that which is now but darkly seen shall be clear? As I read this little fragmentary sketch, I think of the rest. Is it, and where is it? Will not the leaf be turned some day, and the story be told? Shall the deviser of the tale somewhere perfect? the history of little Emma's griefs and troubles. Shall Titania come forth complete with her sportive court, with the flowers at her feet, the forest around her, and all the stars of summer glittering overhead? How well I remember the delight and wonder and pleasure with which I read Jane Eyre, sent to me by an author whose name and sex were then alike unknown to me. The strange fascinations of the book and how with my own work pressing upon me I could not, having taken the volumes up, lay them down until they were read through. Hundreds of those who, like myself, recognized and admired that master work of a great genius 
will look with a mournful interest and regard and curiosity upon this, that last fragmentary sketch from the noble hand which wrote Jane Eyre. W. M. T. End of Preface Chapter One of Emma, A Fragment of a Story by Charlotte Bronte. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter One We all seek an ideal in life. A pleasant fancy began to visit me in a certain year that perhaps the number of human beings is few who do not find their quest at some era of life for some space more or less brief i had certainly not found mine in youth though the strong belief i held of its existence sufficed through all my brightest and freshest time to keep me hopeful i had not found it in maturity i was become resigned to never find it i had lived certain dim years entirely tranquil and unexpectant and now I was not sure but something was hovering round my hearth which pleased me wonderfully. Look at it, reader. Come into my parlour and judge for yourself whether I do right to care for this thing. First, you may scan me, if you please. We shall go on better together after a satisfactory introduction and due apprehension of identity. My name is Mrs. Chalfont. I am a widow. My house is good, and my income such as need not check the impulse either of charity or a moderate hospitality. I am not young, nor yet old. There is no silver yet in my hair, but its yellow lustre is gone. In my face wrinkles are yet to come, but I have almost forgotten the days when it wore any bloom. I married when I was very young. I lived for fifteen years, a life which, whatever its trials, could not be called stagnant. Then for five years I was alone, and having no children, desolate. Lately fortune, by a somewhat curious turn of her wheel, placed in my way an interest and a companion. The neighbourhood where I live is pleasant enough, its scenery agreeable, and its society civilised, though not numerous. About a mile from my house there is a ladies' school, established but lately, not more than three years since. The conductresses of this school were of my acquaintances, and though I cannot say that they occupied the very highest place in my opinion, for they had brought back from some months residence abroad for finishing purposes a good deal that was fantastic affected and pretentious yet i awarded them some portion of that respect which seems the fair due of all women who face life bravely and try to make their own way by their own efforts about a year after the mrs wilcox opened their school when the number of their pupils was as yet exceedingly limited and when no doubt they were looking out anxiously enough for augmentation the entrance gate to their little drive was one day thrown back to admit a carriage. A very handsome, fashionable carriage, Miss Mabel Wilcox said, in narrating the circumstance afterwards, and drawn by a pair of really splendid horses. The sweep up the drive, the loud ring at the doorbell, the bustling entrance into the house, the ceremonious admission to the bright drawing-room, roused excitement enough in Fuchsia Lodge. Miss Wilcox repaired to the reception-room in a pair of new gloves, and carrying in her hand a handkerchief of French cambric. She found a gentleman seated on the sofa, who, as he rose up, appeared a tall, fine-looking personage, at least she thought him so, as he stood with his back to the light. He introduced himself as Mr. Fitzgibbon, inquired if Miss Wilcox had a vacancy, and intimated that he wished to entrust to her care a new pupil in the shape of his daughter. This was welcome news, for there was many a vacancy in Miss Wilcox's schoolroom. Indeed, her establishment was as yet limited to the select number of three, and she and her sisters were looking forward with anything but confidence to the balancing of accounts at the close of their first half-year. Few objects could have been more agreeable to her, then, than that to which by a wave of the hand Mr. Fitzgibbon now directed her attention, the figure of a child standing near the drawing-room window. Had Miss Wilcox's establishment boasted fuller ranks, had she indeed entered well on that course of prosperity which in after years an undeviating attention to externals enabled her so triumphantly to realise, an early thought with her would have been to judge whether the acquisition now offered was likely to answer well as a show pupil. She would have instantly marked her look, dress, etc., and inferred her value from these indicia. In those anxious commencing times, however, Miss Wilcox could scarce afford herself the luxury of such appreciation a new pupil represented forty pounds a year, independently of master's terms, 
and forty pounds a year was a sum Miss Wilcox needed and was glad to secure. Besides, the fine carriage, the fine gentleman, and the fine name gave gratifying assurance enough and to spare of eligibility in the preferred connection. It was admitted then that there were vacancies in Future Lodge, that Miss Fitzgibbon could be received at once, that she was to learn all that the school prospectus proposed to teach, to be liable to every extra, in short, to be as expensive and consequently as profitable a pupil as any directress's heart could wish. All this was arranged as upon velvet, smoothly and liberally. Mr. Fitzgibbon showed in the transaction none of the hardness of the bargain-making man of business, and as little of the penurious anxiety of the straitened professional man. Miss Wilcox felt him to be quite the gentleman. Everything disposed her to be partially inclined towards the little girl whom he, on taking leave, formally committed to her guardianship and as if no circumstance should be wanting to complete her happy impression the address left written on a card served to fill up the measure of miss wilcox's satisfaction conway fitzgibbon esq may park midland county that very day three decrees were passed in the newcomer's favour one that she was to be miss wilcox's bedfellow two to sit next to her at table three to walk out with her in a few days it became evident that a fourth secret clause had been added to these, that is, that Miss Fitzgibbon was to be favoured, petted, and screened on all possible occasions. An ill-conditioned pupil, who before coming to Fuchsia Lodge had passed a year under the care of a certain old-fashioned Mrs. Stirling of Hartwood, and from them had picked up unpractical notions of justice, took it upon her to utter an opinion on this system of favouritism. The Mrs. Stirling, she injudiciously said, never distinguished any girl because she was richer or better dressed than the rest. They would have scorned to do so. They always rewarded girls, according as they behaved well to their schoolfellows and minded their lessons, not according to the number of their silk dresses and fine laces and feathers. For it must not be forgotten that Miss Fitzgibbon's trunks, when opened, disclosed a splendid wardrobe so fine were the various articles of apparel indeed that instead of assigning for their accommodation the painted deal drawers of the school bedroom miss wilcox had them arranged in a mahogany bureau in her own room with her own hands too she would on sunday array the little favourite in her quilted silk pelisse her hat and feathers her ermine boa and little french boots and gloves and very self-complacent she felt when she led the young heiress a letter from mr fitzgibbon received since his first visit had communicated the additional particulars that his daughter was his only child and would be the inheritress of his estates including may park midland county when she led her i say into the church and seated her stately by her side at the top of the gallery pew unbiased observers might indeed have wondered what there was to be proud of and puzzled their heads to detect the special merits of this little woman in silk for, to speak truth, Miss Fitzgibbon was far from being the beauty of the school. There were two or three blooming little faces amongst her companions lovelier than hers. Had she been a poor child, Miss Wilcox herself would not have liked her physiognomy at all. Rather, indeed, would it have repelled than attracted her. And, moreover, though Miss Wilcox hardly confessed the circumstance to herself, but on the contrary strove hard not to be conscious of it, there were moments when she became sensible of a certain strange weariness in continuing her system of partiality. It hardly came natural to her to show this special distinction in this particular instance. An undefined wonder would smite her sometimes that she did not take more real satisfaction in flattering and caressing this embryo heiress, that she did not like better to have her always at her side under her special charge. On principle, Miss Wilcox continued the plan she had begun on principle for she argued with herself this is the richest and most aristocratic of my pupils she brings me the most credit and the most profit therefore i ought in justice to show her a special indulgence which she did but with a gradually increasing peculiarity of feeling certainly the undue favours showered on little miss fitzgibbon brought their object no real benefit unfitted for the character of playfellow by her position of favourite her fellow pupils rejected her company as decidedly as they dared active rejection was not long necessary it was soon seen that passive avoidance would suffice the pet was not social no even miss wilcox never thought her social when she sent for her to show her fine clothes in the drawing-room when there was company and especially when she had her into the parlour of an evening to be her own companion miss wilcox used to feel curiously perplexed she would try to talk affably to the young heiress, to draw her out, to amuse her. 
to herself the governess could render no reason why her efforts soon flagged but this was invariably the case however miss wilcox was a woman of courage and be the protege what she might the patroness did not fail to continue on principle her system of preference a favourite has no friends and the observation of a gentleman who about this time called at the lodge and chanced to see miss fitzgibbon was that child looks consummately unhappy he was watching miss fitzgibbon as she walked by herself fine and solitary while her schoolfellows were merrily playing who is this miserable little white he asked he was told her name and dignity wretched little soul he repeated and he watched her pace down the walk and back again marching upright her hands in her ermine muff her fine pelisse showing a gay sheen to the winter sun her large leghorn hat shading such a face as fortunately had not its parallel on the premises wretched little soul reiterated the gentleman he opened the drawing-room window watched the bearer of the muff till he caught her eye and then summoned her with his finger she came he stooped his head down to her she lifted her face up to him don't you play little girl no sir no why not do you think yourself better than other children no answer is it because people tell you you are rich you won't play the young lady was gone he stretched his hand to arrest her but she wheeled beyond his reach and ran quickly out of sight an only child pleaded miss wilcox possibly spoiled by her papa you know we must excuse a little pettishness humph i am afraid there is not a little to excuse end of chapter one chapter two of emma a fragment of a story by charlotte bronte this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. chapter two mr ellen the gentleman mentioned in the last chapter was a man who went where he liked and being a gossiping leisurely person he liked to go almost anywhere he could not be rich he lived so quietly and yet he must have had some money for without apparent profession he continued to keep a house and a servant he always spoke of himself as having once been a worker but if so that could not have been very long since for he still looked far from old sometimes of an evening under a little social conversational excitement he would look quite young but he was changeable in mood and complexion and expression and had chameleon eyes sometimes blue and merry sometimes grey and dark and anon green and gleaming on the whole he might be called a fair man of average height rather thin and wiry he had not resided more than two years in the present neighbourhood his antecedents were unknown there but as the rector a man of good family and standing and of undoubted scrupulousness in the choice of acquaintance had introduced him he found everywhere a prompt reception of which nothing in his conduct had yet seemed to prove him unworthy some people indeed dubbed him a character and fancied him eccentric but others could not see the appropriateness of the epithets he always seemed to them very harmless and quiet not always perhaps so perfectly unreserved and comprehensible as might be wished he had a discomposing expression in his eye and sometimes in conversation an ambiguous diction but still they believed he meant no harm mr ellen often called on the misses wilcox he sometimes took tea with them he appeared to like tea and muffins and not to dislike the kind of conversation which usually accompanies that refreshment he was said to be a good shot a good angler he proved himself an excellent gossip he liked gossip well on the whole he liked women's society and did not seem to be particular in requiring difficult accomplishments or rare endowments in his female acquaintance the Mrs. Wilcox, for instance, were not much less shallow than the china saucer which held their teacups. Yet Mr. Ellen got on perfectly well with them, and had apparently great pleasure in hearing them discuss all the details of their school. He knew the names of all their young ladies, too, and would shake hands with them if he met them walking out. He knew their examination days and gala days, and more than once accompanied Mr. Cecil, the curate, when he went to examine in ecclesiastical history this ceremony took place weekly on wednesday afternoons after which mr cecil sometimes stayed tea and usually found two or three lady parishioners invited to meet him mr ellen was also pretty sure to be there rumour gave one of the misses wilcox in anticipated wedlock to the curate 
and furnished his friend with a second in the same tender relation so that it is to be conjectured they made a social pleasant party under such interesting circumstances their evenings rarely passed without miss fitzgibbon being introduced all worked muslin and streaming sash and elaborated ringlets others of the pupils would also be called in perhaps to sing to show off a little at the piano or sometimes to repeat poetry miss wilcox conscientiously cultivated display in her young ladies thinking she thus fulfilled a duty to herself and to them at once spreading her own fame and giving the children self-possessed manners it was curious to note how on these occasions good genuine natural qualities still vindicated their superiority to counterfeit artificial advantages while dear miss fitzgibbon dressed up and flattered as she was could only sidle round the circle with the crestfallen air which seemed natural to her just giving her hand to the guests then almost snatching it away and sneaking in unmannerly haste to the place allotted to her at miss wilcox's side which place she filled like a piece of furniture neither smiling nor speaking the evening through while such was her deportment certain of her companions as mary franks jessie newton etc handsome open-countenanced little damsels fearless because harmless would enter with a smile of salutation and a blush of pleasure make their pretty reverence at the drawing-room door stretch a friendly little hand to such visitors as they knew and sit down to the piano to play their well-practised duet with an innocent obliging readiness which won all hearts there was a girl called diana the girl alluded to before as having once been miss sterling's pupil a daring brave girl much loved and a little feared by her comrades she had good faculties both physical and mental was clever honest and dauntless in the schoolroom she set her young brow like a rock against miss fitzgibbon's pretensions she found also heart and spirit to withstand them in the drawing-room one evening when the curate had been summoned away by some piece of duty directly after tea and there was no stranger present but mr ellen diana had been called in to play a long difficult piece of music which she could execute like a master she was still in the midst of her performance when mr ellen having for the first time perhaps recognized the existence of the heiress by asking if she was cold miss wilcox took the opportunity of launching into a strain of commendation on miss fitzgibbon's inanimate behavior terming it ladylike modest and exemplary whether miss wilcox's constrained tone betrayed how far she was from really feeling the approbation she expressed how entirely she spoke from a sense of duty and not because she felt it possible to be in any degree charmed by the personage she praised or whether diana who was by nature hasty had a sudden fit of irritability is not quite certain but she turned on her music-stool ma'am said she to miss wilcox that girl does not deserve so much praise her behaviour is not at all exemplary in the schoolroom she is insolently distant for my part i denounce her airs there is not one of us but is as good or better than she though we may not be as rich and diana shut up the piano took her music-book under her arm curtsied and vanished strange to relate miss wilcox said not a word at the time nor was diana subsequently reprimanded for this outbreak miss fitzgibbon had now been three months at the school and probably the governess had had leisure to wear out her early raptures of partiality indeed as time advanced this evil often seemed likely to right itself again and again it seemed that miss fitzgibbon was about to fall to her proper level but then somewhat provokingly to the lovers of reason and justice some little incident would occur to invest her insignificance with artificial interest once it was the arrival of a great basket of hothouse fruit melons grapes and pines as a present to miss wilcox in miss fitzgibbon's name whether it was that a share of these luscious productions was imparted too freely to the nominal donor or whether she had had a surfeit of cake on miss mabel wilcox's birthday it so befell that in some disturbed state of the digestive organs miss fitzgibbon took to sleep-walking she one night terrified the school into a panic by passing through the bedrooms all white in her nightdress moaning and holding out her hands as she went dr percy was then sent for his medicines probably did not suit the case for within a fortnight after the somnambulistic feat miss wilcox going upstairs in the dark trod on something which she thought was the cat and on calling for a light found her darling matilda fitzgibbon curled round on the landing blue cold and stiff without any light in her half-open eyes or any colour in her lips or movement in her limbs she was not soon roused from this fit her senses seemed half scattered and miss wilcox had now an undeniable excuse for keeping her all day on the drawing-room sofa and making more of her than ever 
there comes a day of reckoning both for petted heiresses and partial governesses one clear winter morning as mr ellen was seated at breakfast enjoying his bachelor's easy-chair and damp fresh london newspaper a note was brought to him marked private and in haste the last injunction was vain for william ellen did nothing in haste he had no haste in him he wondered anybody should be so foolish as to hurry life was short enough without it he looked at the little note three-cornered scented and feminine he knew the handwriting it came from the very lady rumour had so often assigned him as his own the bachelor took out a morocco case selected from a variety of little instruments a pair of scissors cut round the seal and read miss wilcox's compliments to mr ellen and she should be truly glad to see him for a few minutes if at leisure miss w requires a little advice she will reserve explanations till she sees mr e mr ellen very quietly finished his breakfast then as it was a very fine december day hoar and crisp but serene and not bitter he carefully prepared himself for the cold took his cane and set out he liked the walk the air was still the sun not wholly ineffectual the path firm and but lightly powdered with snow he made his journey as long as he could by going round through many fields and through winding unfrequented lanes when there was a tree in the way conveniently placed for support he would sometimes stop lean his back against the trunk fold his arms and muse if rumour could have seen him she would have affirmed that he was thinking about miss wilcox perhaps when he arrives at the lodge his demeanour will inform us whether such an idea be warranted at last he stands at the door and rings the bell he is admitted and shown into the parlour a smaller and more private room than the drawing-room miss wilcox occupies it she is seated at her writing-table she rises not without air and grace to receive her visitor this air and grace she learned in france for she was in a parisian school for six months and learned there a little french and a stock of gestures and courtesies no it is certainly not impossible that mr ellen may admire miss wilcox she is not without prettiness any more than are her sisters and she and they are one and all smart and showy bright stone blue is a colour they like in dress a crimson bow rarely fails to be pinned on somewhere to give contrast positive colours generally grass greens red violets deep yellows are in favour with them all harmonies are at a discount many people would think miss wilcox standing there in her blue merino dress and pomegranate ribbon a very agreeable woman she has regular features the nose is a little sharp the lips a little thin good complexion light red hair she is very business-like very practical she never in her life knew a refinement of feeling or of thought she is entirely limited respectable and self-satisfied she has a cool prominent eye sharp and shallow pupil unshrinking and inexpensive pale iris light eyelashes light brow miss wilcox is a very proper and decorous person but she could not be delicate or modest because she is naturally destitute of sensitiveness her voice when she speaks has no vibration her face no expression her manner no emotion blush or tremor she never knew what can i do for you miss wilcox says mr ellen approaching the writing-table and taking a chair beside it perhaps you can advise me was the answer or perhaps you can give me some information i feel so thoroughly puzzled and really fear all is not right where and how i will have redress if it be possible pursued the lady but how to set about obtaining it draw to the fire mr ellen it is a cold day they both drew to the fire she continued you know the christmas holidays are near he nodded well about a fortnight since i wrote as is customary to the friends of my pupils notifying the day when we break up and requesting that if it was desired that any girl should stay the vacation intimation should be sent accordingly satisfactory and prompt answers came to all the notes except one that addressed to conway fitzgibbon esq may park midland county matilda fitzgibbon's father you know what won't he let her go home let her go home my dear sir you shall hear two weeks elapsed during which i daily expected an answer none came i felt annoyed at the delay as i had particularly requested a speedy reply this very morning i had made up my mind to write again when what do you think the post brought me i should like to know my own letter actually my own returned from the post office with an intimation such an intimation but read for yourself she handed to mr ellen an envelope he took from it the returned note and a paper the paper bore a hastily scrawled line or two 
it said in brief terms that there was no such place in midland county as may park and that no such person had ever been heard of there as conway fitzgibbon esq on reading this mr ellen slightly opened his eyes i hardly thought it was so bad as this said he what you did think it was bad then you suspected that something was wrong really i scarcely know what i thought or suspected how very odd no such place as may park the grand mansion the grounds the oaks the deer vanished clean away and then fitzgibbon himself but you saw fitzgibbon he came in his carriage in his carriage echoed miss wilcox a most stylish equipage and himself the most distinguished person do you think after all there is some mistake certainly a mistake but when it is rectified i don't think fitzgibbon or may park will be forthcoming shall i run down to midland county and look after these two precious objects oh would you be so good mr ellen i knew you would be so kind personal inquiry you know there's nothing like it nothing at all meantime what shall you do with the child the pseudo heiress if pseudo she be shall you correct her let her know her place i think responded miss wilcox reflectively i think not exactly as yet my plan is to do nothing in a hurry we will inquire first if after all she should turn out to be connected as was at first supposed one had better not do anything which one might afterwards regret no i shall make no difference with her till i hear from you again very good as you please said mr ellen with that coolness which made him so convenient a counsellor in miss wilcox's opinion in his dry laconism she found the response suited to her outer worldliness she thought he said enough if he did not oppose her the comment he stinted so avariciously she did not want mr ellen ran down as he said to midland county it was an errand that seemed to suit him for he had curious predilections as well as peculiar methods of his own any secret quest was to his taste perhaps there was something of the amateur detective in him he could conduct an inquiry and draw no attention his quiet face never looked inquisitive nor did his sleepless eye betray vigilance he was away about a week the day after his return he appeared in miss wilcox's presence as cool as if he had seen her but yesterday confronting her with that fathomless face he liked to show her he first told her he had done nothing let mr ellen be as enigmatical as he would he never puzzled miss wilcox she never saw enigma in the man some people feared because they did not understand him to her it had not yet occurred to begin to spell his nature or analyse his character if she had an impression about him it was that he was an idle but obliging man not aggressive of few words but often convenient whether he were clever and deep or deficient and shallow close or open odd or ordinary she saw no practical end to be answered by inquiry and therefore did not inquire why had he done nothing she now asked chiefly because there was nothing to do then he could give her no information not much only this indeed conway fitzgibbon was a man of straw may park a house of cards there was no vestige of such man or mansion in midland county or in any other shire in england tradition herself had nothing to say about either the name or the place the oracle of old deeds and registers when consulted had not responded who can he be then that came here and who is this child that's just what i can't tell you an incapacity which makes me say i have done nothing and how am i to get paid can't tell you that either a quarter's board and education owing and master's terms besides pursued miss wilcox how infamous i can't afford the loss and if we were only in the good old times said mr ellen where we ought to be you might just send miss matilda out to the plantations in virginia sell her for what she is worth and pay yourself matilda indeed and fitzgibbons a little impostor i wonder what her real name is betty hodge paul smith hannah jones suggested mr ellen now cried miss wilcox give me credit for sagacity it's very odd but try as i would and i made every effort i never could really like that child she has had every indulgence in this house and i am sure i made great sacrifice of feeling to principle in showing her much attention for i could not make any one believe the degree of antipathy i have all along felt towards her yes i can believe it i saw it did you well it proves that my discernment is rarely at fault her game is now up however and time it was i have said nothing to her yet but now have her in whilst i am here said mr ellen has she known of this business is she in the secret is she herself an accomplice or mere tool have her in miss wilcox rang the bell demanded matilda fitzgibbon and the false heiress soon appeared 
she came in her ringlets her sash and her furbelowed dress adornments alas no longer acceptable stand there said miss wilcox sternly checking her as she approached the hearth stand there on the further side of the table i have a few questions to put to you and your business will be to answer them and mind let us have the truth we will not endure lies ever since miss gibbon had been found in the fit her face had retained a peculiar paleness and her eyes a dark orbit when thus addressed she began to shake and blanch like conscious guilt personified who are you demanded miss wilcox and what do you know about yourself a sort of half interjection escaped the girl's lips it was a sound expressing partly fear and partly the shock which the nerves feel when an evil very long expected at last and suddenly arrives keep yourself still and reply if you please said miss wilcox whom nobody should blame for lacking pity because nature had not made her compassionate what is your name we know you have no right to that of matilda fitzgibbon she gave no answer i do insist upon a reply speak you shall sooner or later so you had better do it at once this inquisition had evidently a very strong effect upon the subject of it she stood as if palsied trying to speak but apparently not competent to articulate miss wilcox did not fly into a passion but she grew very stern and urgent spoke a little loud and there was a dry clamour in her raised voice which seemed to beat upon the ear and bewilder the brain her interest had been injured her pocket wounded she was vindicating her rights and she had no eye to see and no nerve to feel but for the point in hand mr ellen appeared to consider himself strictly a looker-on he stood on the hearth very quiet at last the culprit spoke a low voice escaped her lips oh my head she cried lifting her hands to her forehead she staggered but caught the door and did not fall some accusers might have been startled by such a cry even silenced not so miss wilcox she was neither cruel nor violent but she was coarse because insensible having just drawn breath she went on harsh as ever mr ellen leaving the hearth deliberately paced up the room as if he were tired of standing still and would walk a little for a change in returning and passing near the door and the criminal a faint breath seemed to seek his ear whispering his name oh mr ellen the child dropped as she spoke a curious voice not like mr ellen's though it came from his lips asked miss wilcox to cease speaking and say no more he gathered from the floor what had fallen on it she seemed overcome but not unconscious resting beside mr ellen in a few minutes she again drew breath she raised her eyes to him come my little one have no fear said he reposing her head against him she gradually became reassured it did not cost him another word to bring her round even that strong trembling was calmed by the mere effects of his protection he told miss wilcox with remarkable tranquillity but still with a certain decision that the little girl must be put to bed he carried her upstairs and saw her laid there himself returning to miss wilcox he said say no more to her beware or you will do more mischief than you think or wish that kind of nature is very different from yours it is not possible that you should like it but let it alone we will talk more on the subject to-morrow let me question her end of chapter two end of emma a fragment of a story by charlotte bronte